Fog and mist are the most eerie manifestations of weather. They alter perspectives. They change the look of the landscape, making even the most familiar terrain seem strange. Unlike storms and heavy rain, fog is not a brute force commanding attention by violence. Rather, it sidles over whole vistas and blanks them out. Anything or anyone that moves becomes a barely discernible silhouette. In war, fog can be friend or foe. Fog grounds aircraft, obscures targets and brings advances to a halt. As nature's own camouflage, it has been used to hide troops or enable ships at sea to slip past enemy patrols. On a battlefield, attackers can appear as if out of nowhere before their opponents even know they are there. What is fog? Uh, an assemblage of water droplets, about a hundredth of a millimetre across, uh, which are there in sufficient quantity, no, no, sufficient concentration to reduce the visibility below one kilometre, technically. The most common form is called radiation fog. You've got the earth cooling at night and eventually you get condensation on the small nuclei which are in the atmosphere and if the cooling continues enough, you get enough water uh, condensed out to obscure the visibility. Another kind is advection fog, and you get this when you get warm, moist air blowing in over a cold surface. I mean, in Britain, typically, uh, you might get this when uh, warm southwesterly blows over a snow surface. Brings a thaw, but part of the thawing process is, in fact, to have a fog, and, and, and so you get advection fog. A third kind happens uh, when water is much colder than the air above it. That's called Arctic sea smoke, and uh, it can happen when you get a burst of cold air from the Arctic over a warm body of water, and that can get quite thick if you're uh, in a ship uh, amongst that. But in general, it's, in general, it's much more wispy than uh, advection fog or, or radiation fog would be over land. the Battle of Austerlitz. In 1805, Napoleon set out to break up the third coalition to be formed against him, this time by Britain, Austria and Russia. Its purpose was the same as the other two, to rid Europe of Napoleon and the French Revolution that had spawned him. The Austrians and Russians were to do the fighting at Austerlitz but neither was fit for the challenge. Apart from gross overconfidence and a lot of arrogant presumption, they had overlooked something very important. As Brigadier General Thibault of the 4th French Corps put it, they seemed to forget that they were dealing with the greatest commander in the world, that even his apparently unconsidered actions were the direct reflections of some very deep thinking. Napoleon's deep thinking included plenty of guile. Before the Battle of Austerlitz, he took steps to persuade his opponents that the Grand Army was too weak to do battle and preferred not to fight. He sent an emissary to discuss a truce. He ordered his troops to withdraw when their opponents advanced and capped that by removing them from well-defended positions on the Pratzen Heights. There was some truth in this feigned vulnerability. The arduous forced march from France and battles at Ulm and Vienna, captured by the French on the 12th of November, had exhausted the 60,000 men of the Grand Army. What was more, the Austrians and Russians outnumbered the French by more than two to one. But by his various ruses, Napoleon had gained a psychological advantage. He had seduced his opponents into thinking that victory was not only certain, but that it was going to be easy. They were soon to learn otherwise. The crunch at Austerlitz came soon after 08.30 hours on the 2nd of December, 1805. 
Columns of Allied troops were advancing down the snow-covered slopes of the Pratzen Plateau, unaware that elements of the French Fourth Corps were hidden by fog in the valley below. The fog gave the French valuable time. It enabled Field Marshal Nicolas Jean Sou, in command, to wait until most of the Austrians and Russians had reached the lower slopes of the plateau. Then, as if out of nowhere, the French emerged from the fog and attacked their opponent's right flank. It was a complete and very unsettling surprise. As the Russian general Mikhail Kutuzov remarked, that's where we're really hurt. The Allies managed to recover enough to mount a defense, but the French built on their surprise move by capturing the Pratzen Heights and pouring down fire on their opponents below. Rather than face annihilation, the Austrians and Russians hastily withdrew. In the annals of military history, Austerlitz is regarded as Napoleon's most dazzling victory. As Napoleon had intended all along, it ensured the downfall of the Third Coalition, and another ten years passed before he was finally vanquished at Waterloo. As far as we can tell, Napoleon considered the fog at Austerlitz and the break in the fog afterwards when the sun came out as serendipitous. He seems to have been favorably surprised by the effect of fog on the battle, and especially favorably surprised by the sun, the sun of Austerlitz that came out and shone on him. And whenever he, he had a break in the fog afterwards, he referred to it as the, the sun of Austerlitz, the, the, the break shining on his army. Adolf Hitler was no Napoleon, but he too realized that weather, even bad weather, could be a very meaningful ally in war. In February 1942, he used fog, mist, overcast and accompanying rain to accomplish the maneuver popularly known as the Channel Dash. The escape of three of Germany's most prized battleships, Scharnhorst, Neisenau and Prince Eugene, and did it, moreover, right under the noses of the British. Until the Second World War, the big gun surface battleships and battlecruisers had been considered all-powerful at sea. But the advent of air power as a major factor in war drastically changed that situation. The big ships were now vulnerable, whether they were in port or out prowling the ocean. And because of the early success of German surface raiders in the Atlantic, the Royal Air Force was both literally and metaphorically gunning for them. For the British, it was a fight to the death. Prime Minister Winston Churchill was quite right to name the Battle of the Atlantic as the most vital struggle of the war. If the Germans could cut off the supplies from America, then Britain and its war effort could be starved into submission. Destroying the German raiders became a top priority, and in 1941 and early 1942, the attention of the RAF was focused on the battlecruisers Scharnhorst and Neisenau, which were bottled up in port at Brest, on the Atlantic coast of occupied France. Scharnhorst and Neisenau were formidable war machines. Neisenau, launched in 1938, displaced 32,100 tons, and the Scharnhorst, launched in 1939, displaced 38,100 tons. Each of them carried a main armament of nine 11.2-inch guns. Teaming up within weeks of the outbreak of war, the two ships sank the armed merchant cruiser Raoul Pindi in the North Atlantic, and went on to dispose of the Royal Navy aircraft carrier HMS Glorious and her two destroyer escorts in 1940. Subsequently, in 1941, Scharnhorst and Neisenau embarked on commerce raiding in the Atlantic and destroyed 22 ships, totaling over 105,000 tons. 
On the 23rd of March, 1941, they returned to Brest, where they were joined on the 1st of June by the 18,750-ton heavy cruiser, Prince Eugene. The presence of the three ships in Brest was well known to the Royal Air Force, which launched no less than 110 raids in an effort to destroy or cripple them. It would be only a matter of time, it seemed, before the RAF succeeded. For the anxious Germans, the only solution was an audacious one. Scharnhorst, Neisenau and Prince Eugene would have to leave Brest, sail through the English Channel and reach safe shelter at Wilhelmshaven, near the North Sea coast of Germany. The operation was named Cerberus, after the monstrous dog which guarded the ancient Greek underworld. To allow the three ships their safe passage home was a lot to ask of the English Channel, one of the most volatile waterways in the world. The conditions in the English Channel, I suppose, are peculiar in the sense that it has this tapering shape and winds typically are from the southwest or, or west blowing up the channel and the tide is coming up the channel and uh, so we begin to get a fairly large tidal range as you get along up towards Hastings and in towards Dover. The Tapering shape again also means that sometimes the winds find it easier to blow over the sea than they do over the land. And uh, it's not uncommon for the winds to be much stronger in the Straits of Dover than they are uh, in general uh, in the area not too far away. Operation Cerberus involved extreme dangers for the Kriegsmarine. Almost half the total tonnage of Germany's capital ships would be at risk along a route that would take them through the 20-mile-wide Dover Strait. In clear weather, the French coast could be visible from England across the Channel. What was wanted was foggy, overcast weather to obscure the escaping ships from sight. The Luftwaffe, which was providing air cover, insisted on it. Simultaneously, the Luftwaffe required clear weather over their airfields in France, Belgium and the Netherlands to enable their own fighters to operate freely. Rival opinions and differing requirements were nothing unusual within the German armed forces, and the Luftwaffe's requirements were not the end of it. The Kriegsmarine wanted no fog and a following wind so that the three escaping ships could use their maximum speeds and a calm sea to help the accompanying torpedo boats defend their flanks. All these conditions had to transpire between the 11th and the 17th of February, when there was maximum winter darkness and the moon was full. These differing requirements were a nightmare for Dr. Walter Staub, Chief Meteorological Officer of the Luftwaffe's Air Fleet No. 3. He was, in effect, being asked to predict the Channel weather on the basis of what he claimed was a scientific impossibility. There was too much emphasis, he said, on climatology, the science of weather, which dealt in averages rather than practical situations. What was the good, Stobe complained, of knowing the percentage of frequency of a certain type of weather in a certain place at a certain time of year? It could never be the basis of a proper forecast. The actual weather, Stobe maintained, can never be approached through such statistical means and frequencies. Understandably enough, it seemed to Dr. Stobe that the weather service was being nailed down by the military, though this was strenuously denied. To make his task even more difficult, the strict security surrounding Operation Cerberus prevented Stobe from using the long-range forecasts put out by the Luftwaffe's Central Weather Group 10 in Berlin. However much he protested, though, Stobe had to produce some sort of prediction. The three ships could hardly be left in port at Brest at the mercy of the RAF because a meteorologist was unable to commit himself. This meant, in effect, that Stobe would have to make an inspired guess. So, on the 6th of February, 1942, 
He predicted that within four days, there would be bad weather over southern England. Sea fog, low overcast, mist, rain. Stobe could not say, though, whether it would last long enough for the purposes of Operation Cerberus. You have to keep in mind that Stobe was working without computers, without uh, the kind of modeling techniques that have since become so important to the meteorologists predictive craft. So when he was making his weather prediction, he was doing a very rough and ready job. And when you consider how dependent the Channel Dash was on certain very precise weather conditions for the Navy and certain very precise weather conditions for the Luftwaffe, Stubbe's predictions were made on a very shaky basis. Dr. Stoeber was a very experienced meteorologist. He had very little information. He did a first-class job of interpreting what he had. Uh, his senior officers, uh, in particular, I suppose, the Admiral of the Fleet, Saal Wechter, uh, understood the difficulties. He, like all meteorologists, felt that they frequently didn't understand the difficulties, I expect. But he was working in very, very difficult circumstances, and what he did was a, a good professional job in, uh, with the information he had. So he made good use of this, and uh, you know, it was a great success that uh, the Gneisenau, the Scharnhorst, and the Prince Eugen, as the Germans call it, Eugen, um, made their channel dash. Fortunately for Stobe, he did not have to cope alone with the responsibility that was laid on him. Additional weather reports were coming in from the German embassy in neutral Ireland, where there was a secret transmitter. The Kriegsmarine also helped by placing three U-boats close to Iceland to serve as weather observing stations. It was the work of these U-boats that gave the beleaguered Stobe the information he wanted. On the 10th of February, he was able to report that there would be a disturbance around Jutland that promised bad weather over southern England. Two days later, he confirmed that by the 12th of February, the weather would provide sufficient camouflage for the channel dash to be made. Scharnhorst, Neisenau and Prince Eugene left Brest under cover of darkness on the 11th to the 12th of February, 1942. The British had anticipated the Channel Dash, but fog, mist, low cloud and rain squalls concealed the three ships until they reached the high danger area, the narrow Straits of Dover. That they managed to get that far was remarkable enough, but the bad weather came to their aid in another way. Despite the proximity of the south coast of England, they were never consistently visible. That greatly inhibited the aim of the Dover shore batteries attempting to stop them. They were unable to get their aim or even work out accurate trajectories. The three ships passed by unscathed, and attacks by motorboats, destroyers and RAF biplanes had no better success. Scharnhorst, Neisenau and Prince Eugene disappeared into curtains of mist beyond the straits, moving at more than 30 knots. On the way, Scharnhorst twice suffered damage from mines and the Neisenau once, but all three reached safe haven in Germany, as planned. The British had to wait until the end of 1943 before they caught up with the Scharnhorst and sank her in the Battle of the North Cape. 
Gneisenau was scuttled in 1945, days before the end of the war in Europe. Prince Eugene suffered the indignity of being used as a target ship in the nuclear bomb tests at Bikini Atoll in 1946. She survived two tests before finally capsizing. Less than nine months before they were thwarted by Operation Cerberus, the British had been celebrating the demise of the German battleship Bismarck. Bismarck, too, had attempted escape under cover of fog, mist and rain squalls, this time along the coast of Norway. Nevertheless, she was ambushed by the Royal Navy and destroyed on the 27th of May, 1941. In 1942, however, the British were hard hit by their failure to destroy Scharnhorst, Gneisenau and Prince Eugene. Nothing more mortifying to the pride of our sea power has happened since the 17th century, rumbled a headline in the Times newspaper. However that may be, no one should have been surprised at the ability of the weather to confuse, obscure, thwart, endanger and generally make life difficult for forces attempting to wage war around the coasts of Britain and Northern Europe. We have to think, what is it that causes the rain? What is it that causes the fog? Uh, the particular features, I suppose, ultimately are the geography, the topography, the mountains, the orography, the shape of the lakes, the shape of the seas, uh, and, this is, and, and the position in relation to the Atlantic. And in particular, um, the relationship with the Gulf Stream and the, this polar front, which runs from off the uh, east coast of America and waves around across the Atlantic, uh, generating uh, depressions which then travel across and, and bring us most of our wind and our rain. There's a whole range of effects, as there is everywhere in the world. Nowhere in the world is the weather quite as predictable as we like to think. We always think it until we go there. And once we get there, we find that there is variability. The difficulties of operating in northern latitudes were particularly acute in and around Iceland, an outpost of Europe in the north central Atlantic. Iceland, a dependency of Denmark was not directly involved in the fighting, but gained importance after 1941 as a base for escorting merchant ships across the Atlantic. That included protective coverage by aircraft and regular use by planes of coastal command, which maintained an airlink from RAF Wick in Scotland. The pressure is low because lots of uh, depressions tend to be around the area of Iceland. Uh, they tend to be deep and so it is windy. Uh, they are frequently deepening and so there is rain or snow. There is Arctic ice to the north so that once the wind gets round into the north it becomes bitterly cold and sometimes you're getting rather rapid changes from southwesterly winds uh, ahead of a front to cold northerlies behind. Uh, and so, yeah, it's a pretty vigorous, changeable climate. As a base for the use of aircraft, Iceland left a lot to be desired. Effectively, this was pioneer territory. Before 1942, the North Atlantic had never been flown in winter, so that the hazardous conditions around Iceland were, at first, unfamiliar. They were certainly daunting. Sea fog, drizzle, rain and poor visibility were practically standard for pilots attempting to land aircraft on the airstrips at Reykjavik and Kaldadans. At times, low cloud over Iceland became, in effect, thick, impenetrable fog as it came down to sea level and shrouded the entire coastline. In 1943, one RAF pilot recounted what it was like to have to land an aircraft in these conditions. 
When we approached our base, we found there was a ceiling of only 100 feet over the airfield. As I didn't dare to come too close to the mountains, I climbed and broke cloud at 7,000 feet. There, I stooged over the airfield, looking for a way down. A few miles away, I saw a black patch in the cloud. I headed for it and found it was a hole only about 200 yards across. It was enough. I spiraled down in tight turns and saw the runways of another airfield beneath me. It was a piece of luck. In the sense that uh, landing an airplane in difficult weather is always dangerous, um, yeah, I mean, these, these, these were unusually dangerous flights, I suppose. If you uh, have this press on spirit that I'm sure they did have, uh, because they knew that what they were producing was, was essential to the overall war effort. I mean, weather is a sort of strategic thing. It, it, its application gets into so many different areas. So they would feel the pressure was on them to produce the observations, and so they would fly when, uh, when perhaps other people wouldn't. But other people were flying through Iceland. Don't forget the air transport auxiliaries were ferrying aircraft across the Atlantic. You know, women who were uh, recruited for this, and uh, th they too uh, landed in Iceland and took off from Iceland. They would have the benefit of forecasts and possibly had the oppor opportunity to uh, not go when the weather was expected to be atrocious, but uh, you'd need to look at the records to just see how far this press-on spirit took people into danger. But once you're committed, once you're out there, you've got to get back in whatever the weather is. There's nowhere else to go uh, in, in that situation because you'll be operating towards the extreme of your range, I would guess, and therefore you perhaps don't have any diversions, and that would be the real pressure on you. An area on a more southerly latitude than Iceland, but still one that posed great hazards, lay around the far north coast of Scotland and the Shetland Islands. Here, freedom from the worst moods of the weather could never be guaranteed. Southeasterly winds in winter could bring mist, low cloud, rain or snow, while the same winds in summer would produce fog. This area was susceptible to sea fog, known locally as Haar, which could make its appearance virtually anywhere. RAF aircraft operating out of Salem Vo on meteorological or attack duties always had to face the possibility that they could return to base only to find fog blanketing out the runway. All too often, diverting to an alternative airfield at Wick or Lossiemouth was impossible since the nearest was around 200 miles distant. Instead, Returning aircraft had to take their chance in the ghostly white murk, and if they got down at all, risked crash landing and so blocking the runway. Several pilots, disorientated by fog or mist, ran into the mountainsides or ditched in the sea. The Shetlands and the far north of Scotland were nevertheless ideally placed for hunting German ships in northern waters and the Norwegian fjords. Early in 1942, the battleship Tirpitz, sister ship of the Bismarck, was moved to what the Germans presumed was the safety of Altenfjord near the North Cape. Having lost the Bismarck, the Germans had become somewhat paranoid about risking her sister ship, which had already received some damaging attention from planes based on the aircraft carrier HMS Victorious. The Germans fully realized that the RAF was not going to stop hunting the Tirpitz, but there was at least one period in the spring of 1942 when they knew their precious battleship was safe. And the reason was fog. On this occasion, an enormous bank of sea fog formed over the Arctic and adjacent land areas so that the Tirpitz, Altenfjord, and the whole of the North Norwegian coast were completely obscured. British aircraft flying on weather reconnaissance were able to observe this phenomenon. They were 100 miles north of Salem Vo when they found themselves with a clear, cloudless sky above, but some 200 feet below this vast, pure white mass extending as far as the horizon. 
The Tirpitz was safe in her nest at Altenfjord, at least for a time. It took several more attempts by the RAF before the battleship was finally destroyed on the 12th of November, 1944. The Germans knew the war was lost. Even Hitler appeared to acknowledge it, but he still had one delusion left. Defeat might be staved off if he could create confusion and division among the British and their American allies with one great decisive masterstroke. For this purpose, Hitler went back to the scene of former German triumphs in 1940, when their unstoppable blitzkrieg had surged through the forest of the Ardennes and erupted into Belgium, the Netherlands, and France. That, though, had been in summer. Four years later, Hitler was counting on the bad winter weather, its fogs and its overcast skies, to fend off the Allied air forces, and so allow his forces to thrust all the way to the Channel coast. This time, Unlike the hapless Dr. Stobe and the dilemma of the Channel Dash of 1942, German meteorologists could be much more certain about their forecasts. It was normal for winter in the Ardennes to be intensely cold and foggy, with snow and rain for weeks on end. The winds were bitterly cold. Bastogne, in the center of the Ardennes forest, could expect more than 20 weeks of below freezing temperatures. Up to 12 inches of snow was not unusual. In 1944, all this looked absolutely ideal for Hitler's purposes. 1940, the Germans attack France through southern Belgium and Luxembourg. They attack in May. And they knew that May is a time when you get the beginnings of summer weather. And it's, it's often sunny, and uh, it's uh, often not a time of great deluges of rain. The April showers have gone their way and brought the flowers that bloom in May. So the Germans knew that that was a time of year when there was good weather. That was not the only consideration that led them to attack in May, but they knew that. They were favorably surprised in 1940 by how good the weather was. It was what the German army calls Kaiserwetter, the emperor's weather. It is, it is weather that is excellent for offensive military operations. Now, in 1944, in the winter of 44-45, the Germans were in exactly the opposite position. They were defending the Ardennes Forest and the Eiffel Mountains. And in exactly the same place, but with the opposite tactical and operational problem, the Germans were once again aided by the weather. Because in the winter, the Ardennes, and especially the, the mountainous bits of the Ardennes, the Eiffel Mountains that extend from Germany into southern Belgium, are inhospitable in the winter. So it was the inverse of Kaiserwetter. Instead of beautiful, clear spring weather aiding an attack, in the case of the Battle of the Bulge in the Ardennes in 44-45, it was bad weather, cold weather, snowy weather, aiding the defenders. At this point in the war, the Allies did not believe that the Germans were capable of mounting a major offensive in the Ardennes or anywhere else. This may have been one reason why the area was lightly defended, and defended, what is more, by only 83,000 young, inexperienced American troops. Added to that, a critical breakdown in US Army communications occurred just as the Germans were concentrating 30 divisions and their equipment in the Eiffel area. The thick forest concealed troop movements. Fog, mist and overcast did the rest.
At 0530 hours on the 16th of December 1944, thick fog smothered the Ardennes as 200,000 German troops and 500 tanks went into the attack along a 60-mile front. Surprise was total. The three-pronged advance surged towards Antwerp and Brussels in the north and westwards towards Sedan. The weather continued to behave perfectly for German purposes over the next few days. Low cloud accompanied the dense fog on the first day and persisted together with rain from the Arctic and moisture from the Atlantic that intensified the foggy conditions. All this was combined with the fitful light, which was all there was to see by beneath the heavy forest canopy. Mud churned up from the sodden ground made movement cross-country a problem for the panzers. However, there was no doubt that what was, in essence, a desperate last throw was masquerading very well as a stunning success. For the Germans, it was as if the heady, halcyon days of 1940, which had made them masters of Western Europe, had suddenly returned. But if they thought that, the illusion was short-lived. The initial German impetus pushed out an extensive bulge in the American lines, so giving the battle its popular name, the Battle of the Bulge. But the Americans were already starting to recover by the 20th of December. By that time, reinforcements were pouring into the Ardennes area, and in the last week of 1944, the successful Allied defense of Bastogne threw the Germans back with heavy losses. Meanwhile, the disadvantages of bad weather to the Germans were becoming apparent. Troops marching along the muddy roads found them almost impassable, and the narrow confines of the terrain meant that three divisions had to share a single road for bringing in supplies. And when Christmas came, the weather improved sufficiently for the Allies to unleash the one vital weapon that the Germans had wanted to avoid, an Allied air offensive that started off around the 26th of December by pounding German supply trains west of Saint-Vith. For the tactical air forces, it had been a frustrating wait. Fog, low cloud and heavy overcast were recorded every day for a week after the 16th of December. Even after the sky began to clear and visibility improved, fog and stratus clouds were still hanging around, but they were scattered enough to allow air operations. By the 10th of January, 1945, the first joyous impetus of the Ardennes offensive had been lost. By the 16th of January, the bulge in the American lines had been ironed out. The Allies had the initiative, and all that was left for the Germans was a long, disconsolate retreat home. Hitler was very keen to counterattack in the Ardennes. It was the scene of the great German victory of 1940, and Hitler sought to make it the scene of a great German victory in 1944-45. Now, one of Hitler's most senior generals, Heinz Guderian, was very unkeen on counterattacking in the Ardennes. He just didn't want to do it. He was most concerned about the main theater of operations for the Germans at that time, which was in the East. So, if you are Hitler and you want to attack the Allies in the West, you have to balance not only considerations of what the weather will be like when you do counterattack, with other factors like logistics. You've got only enough petrol and only enough diesel to drive a certain number of tanks. Are you going to send that precious petrol and precious diesel east to the Russian front or west to the Ardennes? When are you able to do all the other things you need to do in order to make the Ardennes offensive possible? You have to reorient the German army away from the east, towards the west, 
and that takes time. So yes, weather is a consideration, but it can't be the only consideration. It's no good attacking half-cocked early in 1944 if you haven't got the people and the equipment and the fuel to make the attack work. You can't always fight by the weather. A quarter century after the Ardennes, the Americans were again embroiled with an enemy who also recruited bad weather and fog into their ranks. Weather-wise, Vietnam was as different from Northern Europe as climate could possibly be, and the fog that aided the assault by the North Vietnamese on the American base at Khe San had different origins. It was due to what the Vietnamese call the Krashin, a result of the reversed November to April North monsoon winds meeting the higher ground in the interior of Vietnam. In January 1968, well into the season of fog, drizzle and rain in central Vietnam, between 20 and 40,000 North Vietnamese surrounded 6,000 Marines inside their combat base on the Khe San Plateau. At this time, low-level cloud, up to three-quarters of a mile thick, hung over the terrain and could remain there, accompanied by drizzle and fog, for days or weeks on end. Fog at Khe San could be all-embracing. It blanketed the ground, filled up valleys and ravines, and in 1968 descended on the runway and perimeter of the base in late afternoon and early evening. Despite these conditions, the Americans believed that they would still be able to airlift supplies to Khe San by taking advantage of the improvement in visibility and ceilings of around 3,000 feet that generally occurred in the early afternoon. However, January and February 1968 were not typical months. They were infinitely worse than the average and presented the Americans with the worst ever flying weather they had so far experienced in Vietnam. One official report gave a dismal picture of the conditions over Khe San. No one was ready for the zero-zero conditions that nearly paralyzed airlift operations in February. The airstrip seemed particularly bedeviled by fog. On many a morning when visibility was excellent, elsewhere on the Khe San Plateau, the runway remained shrouded in mist. A deep ravine at the east end of the runway seemed to be responsible channeling warm, moist air from the lowlands onto the plateau, where it encountered the cool air, became chilled, and created fog. Fog played its part in the fighting at Kaysan from the very first moment. At 05.30 hours on the 21st of January, when North Vietnamese began to plaster the base with artillery, shrouded from view in the surrounding hills. The damage was considerable. The runway was badly hit, several helicopters were destroyed, and the fuel storage area exploded in a mass of flames, taking with it all but 2% of the marine supply. Fortunately, after this initial assault, the skies cleared and the U.S. Air Force rushed in replacement supplies, fully expecting another assault on Khe San at any moment. The expected attack did not transpire, however. The action was elsewhere, all over South Vietnam as the North Vietnamese launched their Tet Offensive. For the Marines at Khe San, it was just as well. The time for resupplying the base lasted only eight days. Meanwhile, American B-52s based in Guam, Okinawa, and Thailand pounded the area around Khe San with almost 60,000 tons of bombs. The result was almost complete destruction of the landscape, which became a mass of craters, mud, and smoke. 
The North Vietnamese, however, were still there. And on the 5th of February, a bitterly fought battle took place on Hill 861A. Casualties were extremely heavy, but the Marines managed to prevail and push the enemy off the hill. The siege, however, was still on, and the North Vietnamese bombardment began to assume a routine daily pattern. They timed their rocket and artillery barrages for the late morning or early afternoon, when the cloud ceiling was a few hundred feet higher than it was during the rest of the day. The bombardment usually faded out as the afternoon fog descended, but inevitably, it resumed next day. Meanwhile, fog was still bedeviling the Marines' airstrip. For half the day in the first three weeks of February, it was virtually impossible to land aircraft. Several planes attempting it were hit by enemy anti-aircraft fire as they dropped beneath the low ceiling. If they managed to escape that trap and remain unscathed long enough to make their final approach, the North Vietnamese could still inflict damage by firing into the cocoon of fog that enveloped them as they came into land. Eventually, when the season of fog, drizzle and low cloud lifted at last during March, the siege of Khe San began to lose its grip, and not long afterwards, the North Vietnamese withdrew. By this time, the Tet Offensive had proved a military failure, and Khe San had lost the role apparently assigned to it, as a feint to draw American attention away from communist activity in South Vietnam. Khe San was relieved at 0800 hours on the 2nd of April, 1968. Although some fighting continued, and the rescue mission, codenamed Operation Pegasus, was not officially over until the 15th. The clinging, obscuring fogs of Khe San revealed yet again an important, though humbling, truth about weather and war. However mighty a war machine may be, however state-of-the-art its technology, however brave its soldiers or skilled its leaders, the weather has a tune all its own, and everyone must dance to it.